Uh, I enjoy giving this talk because I know of no topic that fires the imagination more than stories of lost gold and buried treasure. And it should be more so for you people because what is probably the world's best known, the world's most sought for lost treasure, lies hidden this very afternoon back of that mountain somewhere out there. I'm talking, of course, about the Lost Dutchman Gold Mine. Now, if you've read anything about the Lost Dutchman, you probably realize that there are about as many versions of the Lost Dutchman story as there are authors. And this is because early day writers, realizing the almost universal appeal of the subject material, but not knowing the facts, simply never let the truths get in the way of a good story. Then latter-day writers, not knowing the facts either, simply read what had been written before them, composited that material, and then they wrote their own stories. So error fed upon error until by all oh, the 1930s, the Dutchman story had deteriorated into what at best could be called gratuitous speculation. But I was fortunate enough to have come to Arizona at a time when there were still men living that either knew the Dutchman Jacob Waltz or intimately knew someone who had. And it was my privilege to have known several of these pioneer families. So what I would share with you today then is not my story, it's not my version of a story, it's not based on research, mine or anybody else's. What I would share with you today is simply their story. Jacob Waltz the Dutchman was born in Germany in 1810, immigrated to the United States in 1839. On the western frontier, most Germans were called Dutchmen. They were Deutsch, Deutschlanders, Deutsch, Dutch, a Dutchman. And this Dutchman lived with a dream, that of one day being the sole proprietor of a gold mine, rich beyond all imagination. So every time he heard of a gold rush, he followed it. Some say to North Carolina, to Georgia, definitely to California with the 49ers. Finally, in 1863, to Arizona Territory. First to La Paz, then to Prescott. But with the Dutchman, the story was always the same. By the time he heard of a gold rush and had traveled and arrived there, all the good ground had been taken. Jacob Waltz, always a day late and a dollar short, that was the story of his life. And so it was in Prescott in 1868 that he gave it up, moved down to Phoenix. Phoenix at that time was a little more than a hay camp where they put up hay in the river bottom initially for the cavalry horses at Fort McDowell, later for the freighters out of Wickenburg. He homesteaded on a quarter section of land there on the north bank of the Salt River built himself a small adobe home, planted a big garden, got himself up a bunch of chickens, even planted a small field of wheat. And when the census taker came by, he gave himself in as a farmer. Well, he didn't stay a farmer very long. Now at this point, we have to turn the clock back to 1865 to Dr. Abram Thorne. Dr. Thorne, beloved by the Indians for whom he cared up and down the Verde Valley near Fort McDowell, was blindfolded, taken horseback by the Indians deep into the heart of Superstition Mountain. There the blindfold was removed and he was shown gold, rich beyond anything he'd ever dreamed of. He was told that he might take away all that he could carry. And here he played a bit of a joke on the Indians. They thought he was going to fill his pockets. But it was cold weather, he was wearing long underwear, which he removed, tied a knot in each of the ankles, filled both legs up with rich gold ore, knotted it off at the waistband, sat it astraddle his ho horse back at the cantle of his saddle, and, minus his underwear, shivered all the way back to Fort McDowell. <laughs> the Indians took it good-naturedly. They said it looked like half a man riding along behind a man on Doc Thorne's horse. Well, at Fort McDowell, the blindfold was removed, and they wished the good doctor well with his newfound wealth. Dr. Thorne bankrupted himself, nearly bankrupted his family, financing his expeditions to try and find the source of his mysterious gold. He failed. He moved to Lemitar, a little town out of Socorro, New Mexico, had a small family practice there, and there, in 1868, 
he met C.E. Cooley, Corydon Cooley. Cooley heard Dr. Thorne's story, believed him, and decided to organize his own expedition to hunt the lost Doc Thorne mine. He went first to Prescott, where he organized what he called the Prescott Detachment. He sent riders ahead to Phoenix and Wickenburg to organize the Phoenix and Wickenburg detachments. And when they assembled at Phoenix and rode out eastward into the superstitions, Cooley had a small army of 267 men. And one of the members of the Phoenix detachment was, guess who, our farmer friend, Jacob Waltz, the Dutchman. This expedition was also unsuccessful. They returned through Fort McDowell, where they disbanded. The Prescott Detachment traveling up the Verde River to return to their homes. The Phoenix and Wickenburg Detachments traveling down the Salt River to return to theirs. Only the Dutchman remained behind at Fort McDowell. And when the rest of them had departed, he re-outfitted himself and headed back to Superstition Mountain alone. Now this would seem to be a very foolish thing to have done at that point in Arizona's history of her Indian campaigns. Perhaps the Dutchman felt that one man traveling quietly alone would be less apt to stir up the hostile Apaches than Cooley's small army. Or perhaps the Dutchman felt some sort of impending destiny calling him back to Superstition Mountain. Well, if that were the case, he certainly got that right. The Dutchman prospected eastward through the superstitions nearly to the present site of Globe, had found nothing, was on his way back several days into the mountains when he was attacked by a small party of Indians. He lost his entire outfit, they ran his animals off. He said he spent a couple days hiding in those caves up in that high rough country until he was sure the Indians were gone. And then he struck out for Fort McDowell on foot. He traveled a short distance when he came upon the vestiges of an old trail which had seen recent use. He followed it into a camp. There was no one there, but there was food on the back of the fire, so he ate and he waited. About dusk, three Mexicans came into camp. They were afraid of him, but he reassured them in Spanish. They said that they were working a rich gold mine that had been worked by their family when this area was still a part of old Mexico. They were afraid of the Indians. They were poorly armed. They had two, only two old muzzle-loading escopetas, muskets. The Dutchman had a modern double-barrel breech-loading shotgun loaded with blue whistlers, buckshot. And so a bargain was struck. The Dutchman to stay on, to help them work the mine and defend them from the Indians in return for which he would be generously compensated. The next morning they took the Dutchman up to see the mine. He described it as a narrow inclined shaft, not so steep but what a careful man could climb down it. And when the Dutchman climbed down it and looked at the working face of the vein where they were working, he could scarcely believe his eyes. There was about an 18 inch vein of milk white quartz that was about a third pure gold. The Dutchman lay awake all that night he was nearly 60 years old, nearly destitute, had provided nothing for his old age, couldn't even go to the county poor farm, there wasn't any. He had just seen what he believed to be the richest gold mine in the world. In the hands of three Mexicans that had no legal title to it, couldn't file a claim on it, they weren't citizens. He began to feel that even if the Mexicans hadn't been there, surely he would have found this mine himself. He began to feel that rightfully it should have been his by half a lifetime spent in the search. He began to convince himself that this whole thing simply was not fair. And by daybreak, he had decided what he would do. The next morning they held a conference. They were running low on food. They decided to go to Fort McDowell to buy supplies from the post sutler. They sent one of the Mexicans up to the mine, which was located some distance from their camp at Permanent Water. Now, he was to put away their tools, put some brush in front of the entrance in case someone just might accidentally come stumbling through the area. When the other two Mexicans had their backs turned, getting their burros ready for the trip, the Dutchman seized his opportunity. 
He shoved the muzzle of his shotgun into his bedroll to muffle the sound. He shot the first man in the back. The second man barely whirled in wide-eyed astonishment when he took the second charge of buckshot in the chest. They both dropped to the ground without a whimper. The Dutchman concealed, calmly reloaded the shotgun, concealed himself behind a boulder alongside the trail, and he waited. Along about dusk, the third Mexican returned. He allowed him to pass, then stepped out and shot him in the back. He dumped their bodies in a deep ravine, burned their outfit, turned their burrows loose, and the next morning the Dutchman struck out for Fort McDowell alone on foot. In one day, Jacob Waltz, the Dutchman, had achieved the dream of his lifetime. He was the sole proprietor of what he believed to be the richest gold mine in the world. But his dream was to become a nightmare. The Dutchman didn't return to the mine that winter. He said he was afraid that the Mexicans might have friends or relatives come looking for them, find them missing, find the Dutchman in possession of their family mine, put two and two together, and decide that perhaps the Dutchman should be the guest of honor at a lynching. He did return to, excuse me, he did return to the mine the second winter. He said he worked the mine winters when there was water in those canyons. But about the third winter that he returned to the mine, things were not as he had left them. Someone else had been robbing his mine. He met an old prospector on the trail, killed him, burned his outfit, but again, the next winter, someone was working his mine. He met two soldiers carrying dispatch from Fort McDowell to San Carlos, killed them, burned their outfit, but again, the next winter, someone was working his mine. He'd killed the wrong men. The man that was actually working the Dutchman's mine was a man named John Pipps. The Pips was killed in an accident up at Round Valley before he could divulge its location. He was digging out either a well or a spring in quicksand when it caved in and trapped him up to his waist. And the cowboys ran to get some ropes to get him up out of there. And when they came back, it had filled him up to his armpits. And he was screaming, get me out of here, get me out of here, and I'll take you to the richest gold mine in the world. They thought he was delirious. They said toward the last one of the cowboys had a tin can tied on a stick and was reaching down in the hole trying to throw the water up away from Pips's face when it came up over his mouth and his nose and he was drowned. Since it was dangerous to try and dig him out of there, they simply filled the hole in and left Pips there in a watery grave. They looked through his bedroll, through his personal effects to try and find names of, of relatives or friends to notify of his death. What they found was two one-pound baking powder cans completely filled with pure hand cob wire gold. The Dutchman sent to Germany for his nephew, the son of his sister, to help him come work, to have him come help him work the mine. But they got along badly. They argued constantly. The young man wanted to file a claim on the mine and work it openly. The Dutchman was afraid to. He was afraid that the manner in which he acquired the mine might be found out and that it could put a noose around his neck. So he told his nephew he couldn't file on it because he wasn't a citizen. That's not true. He was naturalized in Los Angeles before he ever came to Arizona. Well, that winter when they returned to Phoenix, they crossed over the Salt River and camped at Agua Escondida, hidden water up Cottonwood Canyon. And that night, the nephew told him, I don't care what you say. When I get back to Phoenix, I'm going to get some citizens and come back here and file on this thing. The Dutchman said, I killed him. I shot him right square between the eyes. We presume shot him in his sleep. Because in a confrontation, you don't shoot someone square between the eyes. You belt buckle them to put them down, and you finish him off. And he said he put a short length of chain around his neck. And he said, I dragged him up. Uh, under the base of the cliffs, up above the spring, where the digging was soft and easy. And there I buried him in a shallow grave. The Dutchman made his last trip to the mine in 1884. He'd already taken out enough gold to last himself a lifetime in any, any manner he'd wished to have lived here on the western frontier. So he closed the mine. He said he went down about six feet and enlarged the collar, left a ledge all the way around, 
put in two solid layers of logs across each other and backfilled it to the surface with dirt and stones from the surrounding ground so it would all match. And he said, when I was done with it, he said, you could drive a pack train across it and never know that it was there. And that's the problem in trying to find the mine today. With 120 years of erosion on top of it, you could have a, tr a tree two feet in diameter on the stump growing right on top of it today. The Dutchman lived out the rest of his life in his little adobe house there in Phoenix. He, people that knew him said that he seemed to, to be a man haunted, haunted by something in his past. I think it was serious remorse for what he had done to acquire the mine. But at any rate, he lived pretty much as a recluse. He had very few friends, but he had two very dear friends. One was a young black woman named Julia Thomas. The other, a young German lad named Reinhardt. He called him Reine Patrash. Reine's mother had died up in Denver. Julia had brought him down to Phoenix with her, more or less unofficially adopted him. Julia was raised in a family where her parents were domestic servants in a German-speaking household. And although she was black, she spoke fluent German. And Reine was born in Germany. And this was the bond that formed between the Dutchman, Julia, and Reine. Whenever they were together, they always visited in German. Now, the Dutchman lived in his little adobe until February of 1891. The Salt River flooded. His adobe washed away. Some say he spent two days and two nights up a cottonwood tree. But at any rate, Reine got the sheriff and the boat. They came and rescued the Dutchman took him to Julia's home. He developed pneumonia from which he never fully recovered, but he did live there at Julia's until October when he died. Riney went down to Ryder's lumber yard, got some boards, built a coffin for the Dutchman, and they buried him in the old Pioneers uh, City Cemetery there on Madison Street in Phoenix. Now, Phoenix at that time was a small town. The, the main part of town is essentially two blocks north and south, four blocks east and west. Everybody knew everybody, and certainly when anyone died, the entire community converged on the home to pay their respects. But during the Dutchman's lifetime, he was very uncommunicative about his personal affairs. Practically no one knew that he was operating a hidden gold mine in the Superstition Mountains. It was in 1895, four years after his death, when the first, the, some of the first searchers of the mine before the mine became disillusioned, they began to let the story out. It was picked up by a Phoenix correspondent for the San Francisco Chronicle, then it was printed in the Kansas City Star, then it was nationally syndicated all over the United States, and by the end of 1895, practically everyone in America had heard of the Lost Dutchman Gold Mine in the Superstition Mountains of Arizona. Now, at that time, it became very popular to say that you were present at the Dutchman's deathbed revelation. You were there when the Dutchman died? Oh, yes, yes, I was there. Well, did he make a map? Oh, yes, he made a map. Well, do you have a copy of that map? Yes, I just happen to have a copy of that map right here. Well, could I get a copy? Well, yes, but I get $7 for these maps. Okay, here's your $7. Fine, here's your map. And so these maps change hands from bar stool to bar stool, which, by the way, is where they still change hands today. Actually, I, I got to take a break here and tell you a story about maps. A guy showed up at the Historical Society and wanted us to solicit subscriptions for $70,000 to buy a map that he had that was drawn by Jacob Waltz himself in his own hand in 1891. He not only had the map, he had historical affidavits to prove its authenticity. And I said, well, I'd like to see the map. And he said, oh, no, no, you have to pay me the $70,000 first. <laughs> and then I said, well, I'd like to see your certificates of authenticity. And he said, no, you have to pay the $70,000 first. And I said, now, look, you want us to pay you $70,000? I don't even know that you've got a map. And he said, well, I've got a map. And he slapped it down on the table, held it down with both hands. He left it there for about four seconds for me to look at it, shoved it back in his pocket. 
And I said, now this is, is not a copy. This is an original drawn by Jacob Waltz in his own hand in 1891. He said, absolutely. And I said, friend, you ought not to have drawn this map with a ballpoint pen. <laughs> And he looked at me without the slightest trace of embarrassment and said, you know, I never thought of that. <laughs> at any rate, if you got all the people together that claimed to be present when the Dutchman died, you couldn't have got him in a Southern Pacific Railroad car. In truth, there were only two people present. A young man named Dick Holmes and an older fellow named Gideon Roberts. Gideon Roberts was the Dutchman's next door neighbor. He traveled with the Dutchman from Texas to California, up to Prescott, and down to Phoenix, and lived on the uh, Roberts homestead immediately adjacent to the Dutchman. Gideon Roberts was the Dutchman's age. In fact, he died just several months after the Dutchman did. Dick Holmes was a younger man. Now, the Dutchman said to Holmes, he said, Dick, he said, I didn't trust banks. So he said, I made three caches of gold back in the mountains, a big cache and two small caches. But he said, I went back later and I packed one of the small caches out. It's what I've been living on all these years. And he said, what's left of it is in a miner's candle box under my bed. He said, Dick, get it out. Holmes got it out. It was heavy. The Dutchman said, open it. Holmes opened it, and he could scarcely believe his eyes. And that miner's candle box was 48 and a half pounds of gold ore that was just about a third pure metal. It was so rich that Holmes just blurted out. He said, my God, that's rich. That's got to be just a pocket. And the Dutchman said, no, it isn't, Dick. He said, it's a vein. He said, it, it, there's enough lift in sight there to make millionaires out of 20 men. Now, whether he meant it figuratively or literally, of course, we have no way of knowing. He gave the, the gold to Holmes as a grub stake to hunt the mine, with the understanding that he would take care of Julia and Riney if he found it. Holmes sold the gold, most of it, at Goldman's store. Leo and Charlie Goldman had a store in the northeast corner of Central and Washington in Phoenix. They needed an assay basis upon which to base the sale. They took the gold to an assayer named Joe Portery, had an assay shop on Wall Street. The street's not there anymore. And it assayed $110,000 a ton with gold at $20.67 an ounce. Now, to put that in perspective, prospectors in those days wanted real high grade. They wanted gold ore that would run three to four ounces of gold per ton. Today, if you could find gold that ran one ounce of gold per ton, you'd have very high-grade gold. The gold under the Dutchman's bed ran 5,500 ounces of gold to the ton. To put that in perspective, if you had an 18-inch vein of that gold, every three feet today would be a million dollars. Now, Holmes and Roberts had a problem. Was the Dutchman telling the truth? Was he in a raving delirium? Or was he perpetrating the cruelest hoax that's ever been perpetrated in Arizona territory? Well, unfortunately, by its very nature, most of what the Dutchman said was incapable of being checked out. Excuse me. But there were two things that could be checked out. And the first thing the Dutchman did, or the first thing Holmes did, I'm sorry, he saddled up and rode up to Hidden Water. And he spent a couple days digging around the base of the cliff up above the spring where the digging was soft and easy. And he dug up a fairly fresh skeleton with a bullet hole right square between the eyes and still had a short length of chain around the neck. He brought the skull back to Phoenix. Doc Jones, Charlie Jones, had it stuck up in his office for 20 years. By the way, I think I've seen that skull. There was one other thing that could be checked out. In, in trying to direct Holmes back to the mine, the Dutchman was not using place names because it was only in his later years they were beginning to assign names to the mountains and the canyons in the superstitions. But because the Dutchman was secretive about his affairs, if he saw someone approaching on trail, he avoided them. 
he got off the trail, so he had no way of knowing what the names were that were then being attached to the landmarks and the superstitions. So all he could do was describe what the country looked like as he traveled. And Holmes asked him then, he said, isn't there anything you can tell me to get me started in the right country? And the Dutchman said, yes. He said, for one thing, you can ride to the board, board house and back to the mine in one day. He said, I know it can be done because I did it. He said, I ran out of grub. I rode out to the board house. I got a half a sack of flour and a slab of bacon and made it back to the mine the same day. So I know it can be done. Now, the board house was a cavernous place. Matt Cavernous had the freighting contract before the mill was built at Canal. Calvinus was hauling Silver King ore overland to Fort Yuma, where it was shipped by sea around the Baja Peninsula to a smelter in San Francisco. And on one of his back hauls, he hauled back a load of East Coast lumber that had been shipped around the Horn and built the, <clears throat> the first board house in this part of the country. Here on the western frontier, before there were sawmills, you built with what you had. It was either stone or adobe that because the, the cavernous place was unique, it was more commonly simply called the board house than it was the cavernous place. Well, cavernous had sold out to Marlowe and was ranching up around the present town of Young. So Holmes rode up there and he asked him, he said, Matt, he knew him. He said, did you ever know a man by the name of Jacob Waltz? And cavernous said, yes. He stopped by the ranch on several occasions, coming and going from the superstitions. And Holmes said, I was very careful not to ask him a leading question. I simply asked him, did he ever get anything from you? And Cavanagh said, yes. One time he ran out of grub and he rode out. And he said, I staked him to a half a sack of flour and a slab of bacon. Well, if those two things that could be checked out did in fact check out, Holmes and Roberts believed that the entire story the Dutchman told was the truth. I mentioned that uh, Roberts himself was an older man. He died of silicosis right after the Dutchman did. Dick Holmes spent the next 16 years hunting the mine until 1908, when a leg injury prevented him from hunting it further, then sent his only son, Brownie Holmes, into the Superstition Mountains for 40 years to hunt the Lost Dutchman mine. The problem was what I said. <clears throat> he was not using place names. Excuse me. <coughs> I got a little bit of that stuff that's floating around the valley now. Uh, he was only describing what the country looked like as he traveled, and it simply wasn't good enough. They never found the mine. Now the question today is, did he really have a mine? I'm absolutely convinced that he did. And I base this on the people that knew the Dutchman, not so much by what they said, but by what they did. Julia Thomas sold her store, sold her home, converted everything she had to cash to finance her attempts to relocate the mine. She died broke. Riney Petrash hunted it all his life till he committed suicide, killed himself with a shotgun over in Globe. His brother Herman, his father Gottfried, came down from Montana, hunted it all their lives. Uh, Gottfried died in the state hospital in Phoenix. Herman died in his little shack down here on Queen Creek. I knew Herman. I mentioned that Dick Holmes hunted it for 16 years, then sent his son Brownie in for 40 years to hunt it. Obviously, these people believed that he had a mine. Now, my position is, if these people that knew the Dutchman that heard his story from his own lips, that saw the gold with their own eyes, some of whom freely spent the gold that he gave them in time of need. If these people were not in a position to judge whether or not the Dutchman had a mine, then how can some magazine writer in another century say that the Dutchman had no mine? And yet about half of what's been written on the Lost Dutchman mine has been to debunk the idea of there being a Lost Dutchman mine. Now, some people say that the Dutchman died broke. And even those that, that, that admit he had $4,800 in gold under his bed say, what's $4,800 mean when you said there's enough in there to make millionaires out of 20 men? People in 1891 
A shirt like this costs 35 cents. A pair of pants like this cost a dollar. The purchasing power of $4,800 in 1891 would be about the equivalent of $100,000 to $150,000 today. No, the Dutchman didn't die broke. Some say that the Dutchman had gold, but he had no mine. And so they have to come up with an alternative theory to explain the source of the Dutchman's gold. The most common one is that he worked at the vulture mine at Wickenburg and high graded, that is, stole high grade specimens of gold ore. Now, I mentioned that the ore was, was assayed by an assayer named Joe Portery. When this rumor was spread, Portery simply threw up his hands and said, absolutely not. There was rich gold in the vulture mine, but in character, it was nothing like what was under the Dutchman's bed. And Portery should have known because the chief assayer at the vulture mine was Joe Portery. Some people say that there can't possibly be any gold in the Superstition Mountains. Well, let me tell, tell one more little story here. Some people say that the Dutchman had a mine, but that it wasn't in the Superstitions, that it was right up the road here at Goldfield, just a mile up Highway 88. No, it wasn't. There are two reasons to believe that it wasn't. In the last months of the Dutchman's life, when he lived with Julia, several times Julia asked him, she said, Grandpa, she called him Grandpa, she said, you know, you're not well and you're not getting any younger. Don't you think you sh should tell Riney and me how to go to the mine? And every time the Dutchman gave her the same answer, he said, I can't tell you, I've got to show you. Because of the way I covered it, you have got to know exactly where it is. But he said in the spring, when the weather warms up and there's water in the canyons, we'll get a team of horses and a wagon and a camp outfit, and we'll go out to the boardhouse. And he said, we'll have to leave the wagon there. I'll ride one of the horses. We'll pack the other one. And he said, you and Riney will have to walk. And he said, wear your old heavy clothing, because we're going to be packing back into some terribly rough, brushy country. Now, we already mentioned that the boardhouse, and you go a little farther. You know, when you're 76 years old, you've got a tough time keeping your story straight. Wait till you get there. He also said, if I can't travel, I'll have to stay there at the board house with the woman and the three children. And I'll point the way and direct you as best I can. You'll have to go over the ridge north of the board house. Now, I mentioned the board house was a cavernous place. Matt and Alice Cavernous split. In the divorce settlement, he got the freighting outfit, she got the ranch. And she lived there at the board house with their three children, Albert, Aaron, and Anson. Albert was the first white child born in Phoenix. So you've not only identified the, the board house, the Dutchman's point of departure to his mine, by the slab of bacon and the half a sack of flour, you've got a woman with three children living there. There's no question but what it was the cavernous place. Now, if the mine were here at Goldfield, like some people say, and he's coming from Phoenix, why would he go right past it, 15 miles past it, to the cavernous ranch and then pack up into the Superstition Mountains? And why talk about packing back into some terribly rough, brushy country? If the mine were here at Goldfield, he could have driven right up to it with the wagon. No, the Dutchman mine is not at Goldfield. Some people say that there can't be a Dutchman mine in the superstitions because the superstitions are a volcanic caldera and gold does not occur in volcanics. Oh, yes, it does. I took a course in volcanism at the Mackey School of Mines at uh, Reno, Nevada, Reno, Nevada. And I asked Dick Silito, our instructor from London, England, Dick, is it really reasonable to expect to find shoots of gold ore running thousands of ounces to the ton in volcanic eruptives? And he said, oh, good heavens, Clay, the Hashikiri mine in Kyushu Island in Japan, the El Indio mine in Chile, he said, ore shoots running thousands of ounces to the ton in volcanic eruptives. He said, you don't even have to go that far. He said, tomorrow, <coughs> excuse me, we're going on a field trip to Goldfield, Nevada, where the entire gold-producing complex is in a volcanic caldera the stratigraphy is all, of which is almost identical to the Superstition Mountains. Gold most certainly does occur in volcanics. And if anyone tells you it does not, look for some 
hidden agenda, some ulterior motive, some reason why they want you to believe there's no gold in the superstitions. Usually it will be a political reason. Some say that this story can't be true because Mexicans never mind north of the present Mexican border. Oh yes, they did. In 1949, Alfred Strong Lewis, right here at Goldfield, dug into an old Mexican shaft that was timbered with hand-chopped ironwood. Anglos didn't get to Goldfield until 1893. They were using mill-sawed timber. And he had Charles Dunning, the director of the Arizona Department of Mineral Resources, come out and inspect it. And he pronounced it an antigua, an, an ancient. That is, it pre-existed pre any Anglo activity in this area. No, Mexicans definitely mined here, and they mined in the superstitions. Now, it's impossible to say with certainty whether the Dutchman actually had a mine without finding it and positively identifying it as the one that Jacob Walsh worked. So your historical society here takes no position on this issue. I've told you why I strongly believe that the Dutchman had a mine. Now I'll tell you the real reason. Remember me telling you about Dick Holmes? He sent his only son, Brownie, under the superstitions for 40 years to hunt the mine. Brownie Holmes is one of the dearest friends I ever had. He was my partner for almost 20 years. Every Christmas, Easter, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Brown and his wife, Thelma, were guests at our dinner table. On Easter Sunday in 1980, Brownie and I sat on, on our back patio. I live on the and we watched the light of the setting sun play across the face of Superstition Mountain. And Brownie was silent for a long time. And finally he said, Clay, I'll never know if the Dutchman lied to my father. But he said, there are two things I know. My father never lied to me, and I have never lied to you. The old man had tears in his eyes when he said it. Three days later, on his 88th birthday, Brownie died in his sleep. He was cremated. I took him back to a lonely spot in the superstition that he loved. And there, with no one but God and the blue sky for witnesses, I held a final service for my old friend. Then I committed him back to become a part of the mountain that for so many years had been his only home. I would like to find the lost touch of time. The gold, after 58 years, the gold doesn't even matter anymore. But I would like to find it to vindicate the faith of an old man that I loved. To vindicate the faith of half a dozen men that I knew that spent their lives, maybe I should say squandered their lives, in a fruitless search for the Dutchman's gold. As a young man, Superstition Mountain swallowed up five years of my life. Most of it spent down the wall, deep in the heart of the mountain, searching for the Dutchman's mine. And today, if I could turn the clock back to the 1940s and absolutely knew then that I would never find it, with God as my witness, I would do it all over <laughs> Because unlike the others, I found gold, rich, pure gold. No, it wasn't gold that you could mine and carry out and spend. It was simply the golden adventure of your search. My advice to you people today, if you have the spirit of adventure in your heart, go look back at superstition. Go look for that goal. You'll find it. People, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Clay. One thing I didn't mention before that I want to mention now that he has his talk over. This is a video by Arts and Entertainment. It's 50 minutes long without commercials, and it features Clay, uh, Bob Corbin, former Attorney General of Arizona, uh, Senator McCain, and Jim Hatt, and Ron Feldman of OK Corral. And uh, this is available over here at the table or inside the museum at the gift shop. Um, please avail yourself of something to help us with our fundraising. Uh, you've got time to go through the museum if you'd like. And um, be very careful leaving. There's a dip in the road down here. And just about the time you think you're safe, here comes somebody 65 miles an hour. you got a curve down here, same story. 
just don't don't pressure anybody or honk your horn because somebody's waiting to get on that road. Just take your time, leave it. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>
That's the only affidavit that we have, is the testimony of Browning Holmes. And he's the one person that was the closest to the story. Yeah. Any other questions? Was it, was it in later years the saddlebags found in superstition with gold in them and assayed out about the same? Uh, there was a saddlebag, a rotting saddlebag, found back in the Superstition Mountains that had gold ore in it that was very similar in character to Dutchman ore. <coughs> in fact, they put some specimens of it and Dutchman ore under a scanning electron microscope at one of the universities. And while they couldn't make a positive match, they could only say that it was very similar and it was extremely high-grade ore. Now, I have seen it, and I've seen Dutchman ore, and it is very similar. Any other questions? Sir? Only in passing. When I was back there in the 60s, and the Pipers and the Joneses were shooting at each other and killing each other, and the air was full of lead, it was those two camps were an awfully good place to stay away from. Uh, back in those days, we had a stretch there where we were averaging a homicide every 90 days. Everybody was packing heavy iron. Everybody was pat watching his back trail. It was very adventuresome, let's put it like that. <laughs> well, let's wrap it up. I'd just like to leave you with one thought. A couple of weeks ago, there was a map of the superstitions in the Arizona Republic. It showed all of the trail system here in the West End, all of the trail system in the East End, and right in the middle of it was a total blank. Now that's way back in the superstitions where you won't get on a Saturday day hike. But if you ever do get back there, there's a place that's up in a high saddle where you've got a beautiful high view over the superstitions spread out below you, the country that Brownie loved. And there in that saddle there's a rock. And it's weird. This rock's in place so you can't carry it away. Shaped exactly like a tombstone. It was round on top, straight on both sides, and absolutely flat on the face. I took a hammer and a chisel in there. And on the face of that, I carved the words, George Brownie. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I carved the words, George Brownie Holmes, 1892, 1980. Cowboy, loyal friend. And I scattered around his remains around that rock. If you ever find it, I don't tell people where it is because people that will shoot swallows with a shotgun and carve their initials over Indian prehistoric petroglyphs will also desecrate an old man's gravestone. So if you ever get back there, please don't carve your initials on it. But you might just want to spend a quiet moment there. Maybe say a few good words for Brownie because he'll be right there under your feet. And you might tell him that old Clay here is still on his feet. And 26 years after I put Brownie there, that I still haven't lost my implicit faith in the existence of lost Dutchman mine and my faith in George Brown Holmes. Thank you. I think I must have been in the same bar he caught his thing in. <laughs> it's uh, Ray Olson here. This is our first drawing. We have a drawing every week. Ray Olson. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Be careful.